So I'm going to talk a little bit about cosmology, and this will be a kind of armchair cosmology, because of course um, I'm a philosopher, I'm not a scientist, and my exposure to science comes mostly through reading um, books by scientists for a popular popular audience. Um, so I, I should admit that right off the bat. But I also don't think that, you know, philosophy, philosophical speculation has nothing to offer to the modern scientific picture of the universe. You know, as a philosopher, I may not have a well-funded, well-staffed laboratory. Um, I don't even own a telescope, much less a particle accelerator. Um, so my instruments are, are far simpler, I think, than, than those that most scientists have. Um, and my instrument really is language. And by language, I don't just mean you know words. I mean the whole activity of making sense, which, you know, Making sense is, is a conscious activity. Uh, it's a, actually an activity striving for consciousness, not necessarily that we begin speaking language with, with full mastery over it, full consciousness of its meaning. We, we don't, actually. We never really gain a complete mastery of language or a, a, a total under, understanding of, 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 of its meaning. You know, we gradually work our way towards meaning and sense, you know, we try to make sense. It's not there to begin with. It's not given um, by us, at least. It's, it's, you know, there's a certain meaning that we inherit from a sort of socio-historical um, context within which each of us as individuals learns a language. Language does, in a sense, come pre-programmed with certain meanings. But you know, what I'm saying is, is, is that each of our conscious understanding, um, each of our conscious understandings of language is limited and um, always a sort of learning process, right? So, you know, as a philosopher, I'll start getting into these rather uh, recursive and self-referential discussions, and the scientist will worry that I've fallen into a black hole and lost connection with the physical world around, uh, around me, but the thing about philosophy is that, you know, in really looking at language and its relationship to what we call consciousness and what we call being or, you know, the copula, right, the is between subject and predicate that synthesizes them while also holding them apart, you know, providing an identity of identity and difference. Um, when the philosopher talks about language, he's or she is exploring the conditions for the possibility of any scientific activity, you know, whether the scientist is using mathematics or well-articulated logical theory um, as part of their scientific activity, they're, they're dependent upon language. And so when the philosopher reflects upon uh, language itself, I think they do so not in the hopes of undermining science or deconstructing it or making it seem entirely, um, you know, a kind of play with, with words and with no objective meaning. Um, but rather, I think, the philosopher should be trying to justify the findings of science. Um, you know, so when I... Uh, work within, um, you know, the general outlines of a cosmology like Alfred North Whitehead's, and I try to understand contemporary science and physics and biology. Um, ultimately, I'm trying to use 
philosophy and, and trying to develop a, a philosophical account of the universe revealed to us by science. Now, the thing is that, you know, Whitehead has a, an alternative interpretation of what the facts revealed by science mean for, you know, human existence and for our understanding of the universe as a whole. Many would interpret, you know, post-Newtonian, post-Darwinian, and um, Einsteinian cosmology as, um, you know, physics and biology and this sort of understanding of how things work as a whole. Most of us understand these revolutions in science as uh, materialistic, as revealing the sort of, um, you know, deterministic and um, sort of purposeless or mechanistic uh, nature of things and that if, if, you know, if there is a God, science could never prove or disprove it perhaps, but that really we can understand how nature works according to nothing more than uh, laws and bodies, bodies without souls. Um, and there are many reasons not to take such a materialistic picture of contemporary science seriously, one of which is that it fails to account for the conditions of its own possibility. You know, the scientific materialist's understanding of what the universe is, is incompatible with the fact of their own existence as scientists thinking the underlying mathematical, uh, you know, structure of, of nature. How is that possible if the universe is just a blind mechanism? Um, but Whitehead doesn't take that sort of, he doesn't develop an epistemological critique of science as, as you know, a more idealistic transcendentalist or phenomenological thinker would. Whitehead instead looks at the physical sciences themselves and at evolutionary biology and says, um, hey, wait a minute, there's not just the Einsteinian relativistic revolution, there's the quantum revolution, and unless we find some way of harmonizing these two things, then there's this bifurcation at the base of nature, a physics understanding of nature between the continuity of, of space-time and the discontinuity of the uh, uh, quantum uh, dimension of things. And so Whitehead's not, gonna, not satisfied with that bifurcation and it shows how, you know, continuity and discontinuity are both possible in the context of, you know, the ultimate category of the system, which is creativity. So rather than say that there is uh, space-time with certain eternal uh, laws written into it, you know, the equations of relativity, and then there are things in space-time, there's matter or energy uh, that, um, you know, behaves according to the strictures of these laws instead of looking at that as the ultimate picture, as Einstein still does, it's still a pretty classical picture, Whitehead says that the laws that science thinks it's discovered are really more like habits, and the bodies that are supposedly deterministically um, described by these laws are, in fact, um, organisms, in the sense that they are living creatures with internal experience. They're not just surfaces colliding with other surfaces and ex exchanging forces. Um, they are organic uh, activities that are purposefully, uh, creatively engaging with, adapting to, and adapting the environment uh, that that surrounds and, and penetrates them. Um, so Whitehead's is, is uh, an organic ontology. So for him, the most general science is no longer 
physics, you know, the study of the smallest bodies that exist, but rather ecology, the study of the relationship between organisms at all levels, from the physical to the biological uh, to the psychological. You're always dealing with organic entities. So even an atom is already a sort of uh, self-organizing emergent organism. Um, protons, electrons, neutrons, and uh, are all working together to reproduce the form uh, of themselves as an atom. So 